grew up like I did, um, I, you grew up understanding that Sunday was the Sabbath day. And there's pretty much no question of what you would be doing that day. Uh, you get up, you get dressed, you go to Sunday school and worship, and then you come back home and have a big meal with your family. In the afternoon, you might take a nap or play a little bit, maybe some basketball or baseball with your, uh, your friends or, or, or cousins. And then in the evening, you go back to church. Now, if we were lucky, we might be able to get an ice cream cone on Sunday afternoon from Powell's Drug Store. Because in Frostproof, Florida, on Sundays when I was growing up, there were two things open. One, the convenience store, the only one in town, and Powell's Drug Store. And Powell's was only open for two hours on Sunday afternoon, so people could pick up their essential prescriptions that they needed. Now, Blue Laws, uh, of course, started to fade away as I was growing up, but it, I'm sure that many of you still remember a time when almost nothing was open on Sunday. And the reason given, of course, was that Sunday is the Sabbath day. The thing is, if you went to Sunday school long enough, you found out that Saturday was actually the designated Sabbath day. And you read the Bible more and you find out that it never says anything at all about that being changed. Well, that's one of the most frequent questions I get as a pastor. Why did the Sabbath change from Saturday to Sunday? And my Sunday school teacher says, because Sunday is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And that is right, but it doesn't really explain all the, the fullness of it. Christians didn't uh, just up and decide that they would change the Sabbath after the resurrection. They didn't say that, oh, we're going to observe the fourth commandment on Sunday instead, and Sunday is going to become the new and improved Sabbath. <laughs> that, that's not really what happened. You see, most of the early Christians were Jewish. So they still celebrated the Sabbath on Saturday. But then, because they were followers of Jesus Christ, they were together again on Sunday for what they called the Lord's Day celebration. And the Lord's Day would be a, a, a great celebration of worship and eating where they'd get together and eat a big meal and celebrate Holy Communion. And it was only after more Gentiles converted to the faith and Christianity began to spread to other lands that the two celebrations began to be combined into one. And Sunday eventually became the day, at least for us. So Sunday started to take on a, a new meaning. Many Christians began to look at the Lord's Day as the eighth day of, of creation in, in a certain way. Remember, in the book of Genesis, there are six days of creation and then one day of rest to appreciate and enjoy the creation and give glory to our Creator for it all. But something happened when Jesus rose from the dead. It is the fulfillment of God's purposes for our world. It was a day of new creation, of recreation and renewal. So in addition to the meanings of a day for rest and worship, the day takes on a new meaning for us, a meaning of being renewed by the Spirit and recreated in the image of God with Jesus as our model of what that looks like. Remember then that the resurrection becomes a transforming experience not just for all of humanity, but for all of creation in general. Paul writes about this in chapter 8 of his letter to Romans. Starting in verse 18, he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. 
We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. <clears throat> now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If we are going to practice resurrection, like we've been talking about during these weeks after Easter, if we are going to be the people of Easter, then the resurrection is going to mean something more for us than just going to heaven when we die. There is that part of it. Yes, there is the promise of eternal life for us. Yes, but eternal life, that life starts in us now, here in the present. And the world around us should be changed by that because we have been changed. During this whole series, I've been talking about how the only real pattern for lasting transformation is the pattern shown to us by Jesus. The pattern of death and resurrection. And if we really want to be transformed, we will submit ourselves to that. And I know it can be scary, but we can submit ourselves to it with trust. Because Jesus did. And because Jesus has prevailed. And because there is something you really only learn by dying first. Dying to who you think you are. And one of the ways that we need to die is to this idea that, that God gave to us all of the resources of our earth to use in just any way we see fit. Yes, the narrative of creation is very clear that God gives humans dominion, a kind of power, like a, a king. However, remember that we are created to reflect God's image in our world. And we should think about how God uses his power. Jesus, who is king of kings and lord of lords, uses his dominion to come and serve and heal. Jesus reconciles and restores and even gives himself up for the fate of the world. So in the resurrection, the new creation that, that Christ accomplishes institutes a, a fundamentally different way of looking at the world around us. <coughs> the norm that we see is the sinful state of humanity. It's a norm that's based on self-promotion and, and exploitation and on wastefulness. And that way of living inevitably leads to things like violence and war, to sickness and death. And none of those things are in God's plans for our world. The cross of Jesus Christ exposes our world for what we have made it to be. A world that is structured around and motivated by fear and violence. A world in, in which it is dangerous and really even downright fatal, as Jesus has shown us, to live as a human being. But our faith is subversive. And the scandalous claim of our faith is that our violent efforts cannot defeat God's love for us. Now obviously the, the full and abundant life that, that Jesus wants for us is not yet completely realized in our world. But the resurrection puts in place a new kind of life that has implications not just for us but for everyone. As well as, like Paul says, the whole creation that is growing for it. So looking at it that way, what would practicing resurrection look like in our world? It would look like God's people working together with God, not just to avoid sin, but to actually undo the effects of sin itself. It would look like people taking positive actions to recover values that have been set aside. Things like 
simplicity and stewardship and concern for our neighbor and living responsibly. Now, it really wasn't that long ago that, that farmers understood that even the land itself needed its own Sabbath. That sometimes the farmland needed to rest and to lie fallow so that the soil and the nutrients in it could be preserved and that land could be more productive. But it isn't just our farmland that has been overtaxed, is it? Our forests are overcut. Our coastlands are overbuilt. Our oceans are overfished. And our natural resources are exhausted, or in some cases, literally blown away so that we can mine what is underneath. Practicing resurrection in the midst of that would mean living in such a way that the natural rhythms of creation could be restored so that species could be given a chance to, to thrive and replenish themselves. All creation would get to share in the rest of God. All of creation would benefit from resurrection living. You know, often in the worldly way of looking at things, we get pulled into this false dichotomy. You know, you're either for people or you're for the earth. But really in the Bible, there is no such division. Since people are a part of God's creation. And after all, it takes things like clean air and clean water for people to live and thrive in the abundant life that God intends for us. However, what we have to confess is that people are often undervalued and exploited and treated every bit as badly as the earth itself is treated. They're exploited for what can be gotten out of them and then cast aside when, when they're all used up. The choice should not be between people having jobs and us being good stewards of God's creation. As the part of God's creation that reflects God's image, people should be able to labor in meaningful ways that enrich the world around us. And people should be fairly compensated for that work. It is damaging to a person's soul to be paid less than a living wage. And it is equally damaging to make people work in ways that are harmful to the earth and harmful to their neighbors around them. <clears throat> and, you know, for an example, that's why St. Paul's buys its coffee from the place that we do. Most large-scale commercial coffee producers don't care anything at all about the land where the coffee is grown or the conditions in which the farmers who harvest those beans have to work. They just want the beans for the cheapest price they can pay, uh, and whether that's a fair price or, or not. Larry's Coffee, on the other hand, is committed to making sure that the farmers they purchase their beans from are compensated in such a way that they can build a real life for themselves and for their families so that their kids can go to schools and their, their property can thrive and they can own their own homes, things that a lot of us take for granted. And not only that, they are committed to working with those farmers to develop ways to harvest the coffee without clear-cutting the trees uh, and because those trees help to keep the soil intact help to keep their land that they farm from washing away. They also work with them to not use so many poisons that the land becomes toxic to the people who live and work there. If you want to know what resurrection living in our world looks like, it looks a lot like Larry's and other companies who are committed to going about their business in that same way, in a way that does not exploit the earth or the people. Now, I'm aware that, that the sermon is drifting into what some people might consider political territory, but I've been with you long enough that, that you know now I am committed to avoiding politics, at least where it is concerned with parties and elections and the pursuit of power that benefits one group of people at the expense of another. 
But if you look at how God would want us to live with each other, you realize that there is an entirely different level to that conversation. <laughs> it is there where the issues of the kingdom of God come to bear on us and how we live together on this earth. Now, you don't have to believe in, in global warming to know that we need to limit the amount of pollution that we put into the air. That's common sense. You don't have to run around saying, save the whales, in, in, in order to know that we should throw trash in the ocean. You don't have to be a mathematician to know that something is wrong with 5% of the world's population using 20% of the world's resources. And you don't have to be a tree-hugging dirt worshiper in order to know that since God created the world and everything in it and called it good, then we, the people who live in it, should treat it with some sort of reverence and respect and treat the other persons along with us with that same reverence and respect. And when we begin to do that, when we begin to live out the ideals of a resurrection people and take part in God's recreation and renewal of the world, what we will find is that it isn't just us taking care of the earth. God's good creation helps to take care of us as well. One of my favorite writers is Wendell Berry. He's a farmer, philosopher, theologian. And he writes about this in his poem, The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things, who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world, and am free. We are free. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has earned our freedom. Freedom from the power of sin and death. It has given us the capability of, of living as new people in God's new creation. And not only living in it, but working alongside God as co-creators. And no, no, it isn't fully realized in our world just yet. But when we begin to practice resurrection in the way we live our lives, we are preparing ourselves and preparing others for that day when it will be. That day when, as Paul says in our scripture today, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of let us pray. O oh God, our Father and Creator, who has given to us the glory of your image and placed us in a world that is called good, and who's taking us toward a future when once again we will live in a perfect garden filled with your love and your grace. Keep on preparing us for that day when your kingdom on earth shall be fully realized. And help us to live as those people who are first fruits and forerunners of that kingdom. So that a new way of living that benefits not just ourselves, but our neighbors and the earth in which we live will be evident to all around us. Through the name of the one who gives us that new life through the power of his resurrection, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.